services. Adopt U.S. Kids. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to the show Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the respective views of any individual employees of the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. So with that said... I'm just going to say that I have four movies to review for you for this show, four brand new movies. Actually, three brand new movies and one that's been out for a couple of months, but I just saw it this past weekend, or rather this past week. But before I get into that, let me get into my segment, What's Topping the Box Office? These are the top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. So, there are actually quite a few surprises. I'm actually probably the most surprised what surprised rather as to what made number one at the box office and that is the hitman's bodyguard starring ryan reynolds and samuel l jackson which is one of the four movies i'll be reviewing for this show the hitman's bodyguard didn't make very much it made 21.4 million dollars this weekend in the u.s on a budget of 30 million dollars internationally or rather all around the world, including in the United States, The Hitman's Bodyguard made $27.9 million. So, in every other country besides the United States, The Hitman's Bodyguard made $8.5 million. So, that's prob- that's less than one-third of what it made here in the States. But, it's number one at the box office, and it will probably recoup its budget by next week. Annabelle Creation is a movie that's gotten lukewarm reviews, but it's number two at the box office this week, sliding from number one last week. And even though it's got mm, iffy reviews, including one from me, Annabelle Creation made $15.6 million this past weekend in the United States. Against a budget of $15 million, that's won $5 million, Annabelle Creation has made $64.2 million in the United States so far and $162.9 million all around the world, which makes it a certified hit here in the States and around the world by a bullet or by a creepy doll. Either way you, you want to phrase it, Annabelle Creation is a certified hit. Logan Lucky is number three at the box office this weekend, which is where it debuts. It's the second highest grossing debut movie of the week, but of all the movies, it is number three. Having grossed $7.6 million this weekend against a pretty hefty budget of $29 million. Now, $29 million isn't extravagant, especially when compared to movies like Dunkirk and Spider-Man Homecoming, but it is actually quite a bit and it shows that Logan Lucky still has a lot of money to recoup in order to make up for what it cost in production costs alone. I don't have the international numbers for you right now so I will just leave it at that. Logan Lucky's not hit yet but it could be. It still has a chance. Dunkirk slides from number Two last week to number four this week, having made $6.6 million at the domestic box office. Against a budget of $100 million, Dunkirk has so far made $165.4 million here in the States and $395.1 million around the world, making Dunkirk a tentative hit here in the States, just inching its way towards being a certified hit. It may take a while to get there, but I have the feeling that it will eventually. But around the world, it is already a certified hit. The Nut Job 2, Nutty by Nature, is number five at the box office this weekend, sliding from number three last week. The Nut... The Nut Job 2, you know the rest, grossed $5.1 million this weekend. Against a budget of $40 million, The Nut Job 2 is not doing especially well despite its high ranking in the top five at the box office. Here in the United States, it's only made $17.7 million. Around the world, I don't know how much it's made, but here in the States, it's not a hit yet. The movie I'm still as amazed is is hanging in there is the Emoji Movie, which has gotten some horrible reviews, including one from me, and some really, really negative press. 
but it's number six at the box office this week as it was last week. This week, it didn't make a stellar amount of money. It only made $4.4 million, but against a budget of $50 million, that's five zero million million, the Emoji Movie has so far made $71.9 million here in the States and $125.4 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but a certified hit all around the world. So good for that movie? Well, I don't know, but chances are it probably won't rise above number six given its negative press. Spider-Man Homecoming, unlike Emoji Movie, is a great movie, and like the Emoji Movie, it's number seven at the box office this week as it was last week. Spider-Man Homecoming made $4.3 million. It made less than the Emoji Movie. Just slightly, but even still, I'm shaking my head at that. But Spider-Man Homecoming, against a budget of $175 million, has so far made $314.1 million here in the States and $724.9 million around the world, making it very close to being a certified hit, but at the moment it is a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is certified with a speeding bullet. And I know that's the wrong comic book character, but I'm going to go with it anyway. Girls Trip is number eight at the box office this weekend, sliding from number five last week. And even though it's sliding, it's doing extremely well. This weekend, it made $3.9 million. Against a budget of $27.7 million, it has so far made in the United States $104.1 million. And around the world, it has made $114.6 million. So it's made its bulk of its money here in the States, but it doesn't matter because it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. The Dark Tower in its third week in release is not doing well at all. It takes the biggest drop from number four last week to number nine this week, having only made $3.8 million at the domestic box office this weekend. Against a budget of $60 million, it has only made $41.7 million here in the States, but around the world, it has made $71.8 million so far, making it not a hit yet here in the States, and it might never be, but around the world, it is a tentative hit. And finally, at number 10 at the box office is Wind River, starring Jeremy Renner and Elizabeth Olsen. In its third week in release, it just cracked the top 10 this week with $3 million in domestic box office grosses for this weekend. Against a budget of $11 million, it has made $4.1 million, which is pretty good for an indie film. No word on how much it made internationally. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. You are listening to Words on Film on WBCA in Boston, bostonfreeradio.com, on TV at SCATV, uh, that's Somerville Community Access TV, or a local television station that has picked up this show. Thank you very much for picking it up. Or you're watching me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page, on you know, my, my personal page, or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Logan Lucky. This is the latest from director Steven Soderbergh, who also directed, amongst other movies, Oceans 11, 12, and 13. The, the reason that I bring those Steven Soderbergh movies up is because this movie, Logan Lucky, is kind of about the same thing as Oceans 11, 12, and 13. That is a money heist. And it's about two brothers, played by Channing Tatum and Adam Driver, who look nothing alike, but are still quite believable as brothers because of their advanced acting skills. But anyway, these two brothers, who are natives of West Virginia, attempt to pull off a heist during a NASCAR race in North Carolina. And that's just basically the bare bones of the plot. But it's directed by Steven Soderbergh, as I said, the writer of the movie, of the screenplay and the story, is somebody named Rebecca Blunt, and this is her only movie credit to date. I find that very odd because, first of all, Logan Lucky is an exceptionally well-written screenplay, but also Rebecca Blunt is believed to be a pseudonym. Apparently, this is a writer who is believed to live in the UK, and she somehow got the script to Steven Soderbergh through mysterious circumstances, and had been in touch with many of the film stars, Channing Tatum, Adam Driver, Daniel Craig, and all the rest, through email. So no one has met her, if she is a her, or if this is even her real name, 
I don't know. But either way, whoever Rebecca Blunt is, male or female, she slash he does not need to hide because the script to Logan Lucky is exceptional. Again, it's it's a movie that takes place in the South, in the poorest state in the Union, West Virginia. And it's about these two brothers who are crossing back and forth between West Virginia and North Carolina. And what makes this movie exceptional is not only the great acting by the likes of Channing Tatum, Adam Driver, Daniel Craig actually sporting a Southern accent, but not, not only the acting and not only the characters, but this is a movie that does not treat southern characters like idiots there was a movie last year about that took place in the south as well and and unlike this movie it was based on a true story and it was called masterminds masterminds starred a number of really funny actors zach alfanakis Kristen wig owen wilson jason sudeikis leslie jones and 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 several others but what made the movie bad was not only that it wasn't funny but it treated southerners even Southerners who are pulling off a complicated bank heist like idiots. Here, they're treated like human beings. And I really respected that about the movie. And it's even more surprising that this script and this story treats these Southerners like human beings, despite the fact that, as far as I know, none of the principal cast members are Southerners. I know that Channing Tatum definitely isn't, nor is Adam Driver or anybody else. But anyway... So, a little bit more about the story. So, the brothers in this movie are Jimmy Logan and Clyde Logan. And Clyde Logan, in particular, is a guy who's missing one arm. And Adam Driver's character is a guy who served two tours of duty in Iraq, which is how he actually lost his left arm. So, I, I like the fact that he does wear a prosthetic arm in this movie, but I think any other film, particularly one as lighthearted as this one, probably would have made light of the fact that he had a prosthetic arm. And there are some things that were sort of borderline funny about that arm, and, but all the people who made fun of it in the movie, including one Australian NASCAR driver named Max Chilblain, who's played by Seth MacFarlane. Again, I'm not sure why Seth MacFarlane's ne character needed to be Australian, but Seth MacFarlane was funny in the role, and I I'll give him a pass for that. But the people who are making fun of Clyde Logan's arm in this film are basically just mean. And you're also taken in with um, Jimmy Logan's quest to be both financially secure by pulling off this heist with the help of a prisoner who is also in jail for a bank robbery who's played in this movie by Daniel Craig. And I guess there's a lot going on with Jimmy Logan's character. He has a daughter, Sadie, who's played by not a newcomer, but a very, very young girl named Farrah McKenzie, who I thought was probably the breakout star of this movie. And she is not only adorable, but she also gave a lot of poignancy to the John Denver song Country Road in this film. But Channing Tatum's character also has a number of other people to whom he's associated including his ex-wife Bobby Joe who's played by Katie Holmes in a in a small performance but one that's significant he he also has a sister who it's really not clear as a sister named Melly who's played by Riley Keough I I hope I pronounced that last name right her last name is spelled K E O U G H so I'm just going to say Keough and initially it wasn't very clear that Melly and Jimmy were related of course Melly's character is always wearing, you know, Daisy Duke shorts and uh, shortcut t-shirts. So at first I thought the the character might have been Channing Tatum's character's girlfriend, might as well have been, but then you find out a little bit later they're brother and sister. It's not that there was any inappropriate, anything inappropriate going on, but I'm sweating profusely as I'm trying to describe this and making it even more awkward, so I will move on. So the quest that Jimmy and Clyde Logan have is not only to rob NASCAR of their, of their money at this North Carolina racing track, but also to break 
Daniel Craig's character temporarily out of jail while doing it. So it's easy to compare this movie to Ocean's 11, 12, and 13. Uh, probably Ocean's 11 in general, but I thought it had a lot of originality to make up for any comparisons you might have with the Ocean's 11 franchise. And again, this movie gets my ring of a knockout. It is a very pleasant surprise. I'm still not sure why Daniel Craig was listed as and introducing Daniel Craig, but it was kind of an ironic joke for a very ironic movie, and I respect that. <laughs> Welcome back to Words on Film, uh, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. Temporarily lost my mind there. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the next movie I'm going to be reviewing is The Hitman's Bodyguard. Apparently, the, the movie makers wanted to have you believe that a hitman needing a bodyguard was an ironic thing, but that irony is pretty much lost on anybody who watches this movie when they see it. So, apparently, the premise of The Hitman's Bodyguard is the world's top bodyguard played by Ryan Reynolds here, gets a new client, a hitman, played by Samuel L. Jackson, who must testify at the International Court of Justice. They must put their differences aside and work together to make it to the trial on time. So the irony of a hitman needing a bodyguard is that, well, hitmans, I guess, don't Hitmen, I guess, don't usually need bodyguards. In addition to that, it's the bodyguards who are protecting certain dignitaries from particular hitmen. And that's the case of Ryan Reynolds' character's case. And Ryan Reynolds' character's name is Michael Bryce, who is a described as a triple A bodyguard. I'm still not exactly sure what triple A actually means, or if that's the highest level of bodyguards. There's an ambulance going by. Hold on. And there it goes. <laughs> Such is the trials of not being in a soundproof studio. But anyway, Michael Bryce's career as a AAA bodyguard comes crashing down when he is guarding a, a Japanese dignitary by the name of Kurosawa, not the filmmaker. And Kurosawa gets on his plane, private jet, and everything seems to be going right until he's shot in the head while he's on the plane. So, Michael Bryce, for the record, is actually on the tarmat of the plane. He's not actually in the plane himself. So, his career coming crumbling down for something that doesn't seem to be exactly his fault is a bit contrived here. Because it would be one thing if he was standing right next to the dignitary as he was being assassinated. But that's not the case here. So... From the get-go, Michael Bryce shouldn't be held responsible for a shooting from which he was relieved of his duties right then and there. And you'll probably know that from seeing the film. Well, anyway, two years later, Michael Bryce is still a bodyguard, but he's kind of down on his luck. He drives a scratched-up car instead of the usual sleek models he was he was driving or being a passenger in when he was a triple a bodyguard and he's also guarding people who are wealthy yes but more paranoid than they should be in the meantime samuel l jackson's character and i i temporarily blanked on his name i'll just have to look this up whose name is darius kincaid samuel l jackson is a hitman named darius kincaid who is in jail yes but he's being asked to testify against an international terrorist by the name of Vladislav Dukovich, who's played by Gary Oldman in this film. The problem is that somebody could off Mr. Kincaid in a moment's notice. So a previous love interest of Ryan Reynolds' character, whose name is Amelia Rosell, who's played by Elodie Young, hires Michael Bryce as the bodyguard for this hitman. And you can tell from the get-go, once Samuel L. Jackson and Ryan Reynolds share the screen together, that they have had a turbulent past between the two of them. Probably because Ryan Reynolds has been specifically guarding his clients against Samuel L. Jackson's character. So Samuel L. Jackson in this movie is awesome. I think Samuel L. Jackson is one of those rare actors who has been in bad movies, yes, but A, they've been a minority of his repertoire, and B, Samuel L. Jackson has not been bad in these bad movies. Anytime he's in a movie, he always gives it his all. 
The same cannot be said about Ryan Reynolds. And the thing that irks me about Ryan Reynolds in this movie is he's basically trying to play the same character as Deadpool. Now, Deadpool is a character that... To a certain extent, although probably lesser of an extent for me than other people who've seen Deadpool, worked for Deadpool because Deadpool was smarmy, smug, and sarcastic. And Ryan Reynolds plays those exact same traits here. And I'm not sure if it's that the story of Deadpool was better, but even though it didn't work every single time for Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool in that titular film, when it did work, it worked incredibly well. Here, Ryan Reynolds' smarmy attitude gets really old really fast. And he's played this character way too many times. Again, it worked to a certain extent in Deadpool because you're kind of expecting that that's kind of how he is. But Ryan Reynolds really hasn't played many other kinds of characters besides the smarmy, smug frat boy that he played in Van Wilder that he played starting his career on the TV show Two Guys, a Girl, and a Pizza Place. It's just, it hasn't really changed with some exceptions. The exceptions I have in my head, I, I can't really elaborate upon right now, but I think you pretty much know what I mean. Ryan Reynolds plays a guy who thinks he's funny, and maybe even Ryan Reynolds himself thinks he's funny, but when he tries to play to these imaginary frat boys that are in his head, the, the shtick gets old really fast. And I began to think to myself, yes, the movie is called The Hitman's Bodyguard. Samuel L. Jackson makes a kick-ass hitman. Why does he need a bodyguard? And the more I thought this to myself, the more... The, the more I began to gradually lose interest in the film. Plus, it's also riddled with so many buddy action cliches that it's really difficult to recommend. Samuel L. Jackson is really good in it. Salma Hayek is excellent in this movie as well. She plays the wife of Samuel L. Jackson's character, who is also in jail, unfairly. But... And that's explained in the film. But Salma Hayek was so good in this movie, it made me wonder, why didn't Samuel L. Jackson and Salma Hayek team up together? They would have made an awesome team. Kind of opposites, yeah, but I believed them in the few scenes where they actually were together playing husband and wife. I would have believed them as an action comedy team. Unfortunately, Ryan Reynolds brought this movie down kind of the same way that Dane DeHaan did the movie, uh, the, the sci-fi movie from earlier. So, Hitman's Bodyguard gets my rating of a reluctant strikeout. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and just a little bit of a correction from the review I was doing the last time. I was trying to think of the, the movie that Dane DeHaan was in, it was Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. So, occasionally a guy who knows a lot about movies like me has a little bit of a brain fart. That was one of those times. Actually, I do have to say that Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets was a very unforgettable film. And the the fact that I forgot the title of the movie, I, I guess that's that, I guess that goes to show you how much Dane DeHaan kind of ruined that film. But kind of the way Ryan Reynolds ruined the Hitman's Bodyguard. But I'm not going to rip on either of those actors because I I like them in other movies, just not those respective films. But moving on, the next film I'm going to be reviewing for you is a very strange one that I think will be destined to be a cult classic. It is Brigsby Bear. This is a movie that stars and is co-written by Kyle Mooney of Saturday Night Live. And there actually are a number of other SNL alum in here. Um, Andy Samberg, who also produced the movie, or was one of the producers of the movie, makes a cameo in this film. Beck Bennett, who was also in the same comedy trio as Kyle Mooney before joining SNL, is in this film. And also Michaela Watkins, who was on SNL briefly in 2009, plays a major role in this movie as well. So it's very intricately linked to Saturday Night Live, but I think probably the actors in the film would remind you of Saturday Night Live more than the film itself. 
I, I think if this film were to be associated with Saturday Night Live, it would probably be a very strange short film that they usually air on that show when they have no other good material to air a sketch comedy. But anyway, Brigsby Bear. What? Who is Brigsby Bear? Well, Brigsby Bear is the star of a children's TV show. However, this TV show, here's the strange part, is produced for an audience of one, a man by the name of James, who's played by Kyle Mooney. James is a man in his late 20s who still lives with his parents. The catch is, though, that his parents, or the people he thinks are his parents, uh, Ted and April Mitchum, who are played by Mark Hamill, yes, the Mark Hamill, and Jane Adams, actually kidnapped James when he was a young child. It's not specified what age um, at which James was kidnapped, but probably before the age of five. He could have been kidnapped as an infant, but either way, Mark Hamill and Jane Adams' characters basically live underground in the Nevada desert, and Kyle lives with them. And he has not been outside of the vicinity of his home ever. As a matter of fact, he... He stays basically in his bedroom, except to eat with his parents. And his his parents seem like good people until you find out that he's been kidnapped at a young age. So James's only connection to the outside world is this one TV show, Brigsby Bear Adventures, which, as it turns out, was a TV show that was completely fabricated and made up by... The guy who James thinks is his father, Ted, who's played by Mark Hamill. So, to give you a perspective, Brigsby Bear is a show that I guess they were making from the 80s into the present, 2017. And in terms of special effects, it looks a lot like one of those kids' TV shows from the 80s. What I was immediately reminded of was the Disney Channel show Welcome to Pooh Corner, which was about Winnie the Pooh and Friends, although it wasn't actually animated. It was actually people in suits with remote controls controlling their their mouths and their eyes and, and things like that. So I think if you have even the vaguest familiarity with Welcome to Pooh Corner, and if you're a millennial, you probably don't, but if... If you're a child of the 80s like I was, you will get kind of what Brigsby Bear is. The weird thing is, <laughs> these parents use this children's TV show to kind of spread propaganda. And the, the advice that Brigsby Bear gives on this show is so absurd, it's laughable. And the weird thing is, if this show, Brigsby Bear, actually existed, and it was made by propagandist parents... I think that Adult Swim would probably take the episodes and air it on their show and have another hit. It's just, it, it's one of those things that's so bizarre it might actually find an audience. But anyway, after James discovers that he's kidnapped, he goes back to his parents, who are Louise and Greg Pope, who are played by Michaela Watkins and Matt Walsh, and he undergoes therapy uh, from a a psychologist by the name of Emily, who's played by Claire Danes. But there's one thing that James can't seem to let go of. He wants to know what the next episode of Brigsby Bear is. So when he finds out that the show is one that his the person he thought was his father made up, he decides to create his own movie with the help of his his real-life sister, Aubrey, who's played by Ryan Simpkins. And remember, this is a woman. And Ryan Simpkins actually was the daughter of Amy Poehler and Will Ferrell in the disappointment of this year, or this summer, The House. But here she um, plays a really good role. And she and a number of her, her friends from high school, I think, begin to get very enthusiastic about this show, Brigsby Bear. And they help James Pope, Kyle Mooney's character, create a low-budget film with all the props that were actually seized by the police for evidence. But thanks to a sympathetic detective, Vogel, who's played by Greg Kinnear, they get the props and they make their own indie film. And this movie is strangely charming. Again, 
it's it's sad to think about somebody who's been kidnapped at a young age and pretty much held prisoner without them knowing it. And it kind of this film, in terms of premise, reminded me very much of Room, uh, starring Brie Larson, which earned Brie Larson a well-deserved Academy Award. But this is kind of like Room, except not sad at all. It's very funny. I think Kyle Mooney has a very rich future ahead of him in terms of making obscure comedy films. He certainly has a twisted sense of humor, as this movie demonstrates, but a welcome one. And Brigsby Bear, I think, is probably one of my favorite movies I've seen so far this year, and it gets my rating of a knockout. It is twisted, but it's well-meaning and very funny. Welcome back to Words on Film. The spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is one called The Outcasts. The Outcast has been out for a couple of months. Its official release date, according to IMDb, is April 14th, 2017. But I think it was just added to Netflix streaming. And you can find it on Amazon Video if you're willing to pay $5.99 for a standard definition video. But The Outcast is a movie that takes place in high school. And it's about two girls who, after falling victim to a humiliating prank by the high school Queen Bee, best friends and world-class geeks, Mindy and Jody, decide to get their revenge by uniting the outcasts of the school against this Queen Bee and her circle of friends. So this movie is very disjointed, and it's not particularly funny. It's also riddled with high school movie cliches. As I was watching this film, I thought a lot of things. I thought I think a lot of things about any film I see, but mainly what I was thinking as I was watching The Outcasts is I have seen this kind of premise be done so much better in movies like Mean Girls and TV shows like Daria. As a matter of fact, Victoria Justice, who is the character Jody in this movie, she's one of the outcasts, is really gorgeous. She wears glasses that make her kind of look like Daria, if you're familiar with that classic MTV show that was probably the last time MTV was actually watchable. But I was looking at her throughout this movie, and I'm thinking to myself, is anyone else seeing the same woman that I do? She's really, really hot. And Victoria Justice is someone I was vaguely familiar with. I know she had a show on the Disney Channel called Victorious, which was where Ariana Grande got her start. But being a man in my 30s, I've never seen a single episode. And I'm not, I don't think I'm losing anything by, by making that admission. What's real, It's even stranger is that the actress who plays Mindy is an actress named Eden Schur, who's best known for playing Sue Heck, on the TV show The Middle. Now, Eden Schur is really, really funny on The Middle. Here she plays pretty much the same character as she did as she does in The Middle, probably smarter. But Eden Schur, despite that she's the fact that she's 25 years old, actually looks like a typical high school student. So you can kind of understand how she is an outcast in the school, kind of a misfit, and how she doesn't fit in. Victoria Justice, on the other hand, I was thinking to myself, I was watching, I know that she's supposed to be picked on by the more popular students for the sake of a plot, but guys, open your eyes. She is gorgeous. I, I don't see how this how the people in this movie just don't get that. So that's my primary problem with this movie. When the geek or the outcast is someone who's actually not only good looking, but flat out beautiful. But also the movie kind of goes off the rails when the, these two misfits or world-class geeks, Mindy and Jody begin to unite the outcasts of the school. Cause it seems like, when they do, everyone in the school, or most everyone except for the queen bees and the jocks, are outcasts. And once you get to know these outcasts, like there's one person who's a sci-fi geek, there's another person who's a Steve Jobs in the making or a wannabe Steve Jobs, and there's a third guy who's this cosplay guy who's really into Renaissance fairs. Once you actually get to know these characters, they're stereotypes. 
I thought actually there were some characters who weren't quite as much stereotypes. Probably the least stereotypical is a science teacher who is who, with to whom Mindy, Eden Schur's character, is a protege, whose name is Mr. San Samuels, who's played with some refreshing honesty by Daniel Eric Gold. But there's also a principal who kind of sides with the 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 popular girls and guys, whose name is Principal Whitmore, and he's played by Ted McGinley in what appears to me to be a bit of a nod towards Revenge of the Nerds, which in, in those movies, Ted McGinley was the jock who picked on the nerds in those movies, or more not the only one, but definitely the ringmaster. So I thought that was a little bit of a clever touch, but at the same time, again, these characters are stereotypes. There really doesn't seem to be many other sides to the popular girls except that they're bitches. There doesn't seem to be any other side to the popular guys except with one exception, all of them are bullies and they pick on the, the kids who are outcasts. But even more so, I think one of the main faults of the story lay with the characters themselves being seniors because one of the smart things that mean girls did was they had the main characters you know the the mean queen bees and of course the character katie played by lindsay lohan as juniors because when you're a senior it's not that you're not affected by popularity you're pretty much affected until you get handed your diploma but when you're a junior it seems like the whole high school clicks are your life. When you're a senior, at least if you're a responsible senior, you're ready to move on. And Eden Schur's character plays someone who is getting ready to go to MIT, and that's her number one school. And it just seems odd to me, and not even ironic, just absolutely misguided, that somebody who's getting ready to go to MIT would be so focused on the popularity game and getting back at the mean kids. By that age, anyone who's smart would think that they would get back at those mean kids in high school by focusing on getting to college, focusing on succeeding in college, and focusing on succeeding in life. I, at least that's the way I learned it when I was in high school, that success is the best revenge. Or maybe that's just something my parents told me. But it just seems like in this movie, the characters are smart. There's some very, very smart dialogue here written by Dominic Ferrari and Suzanne Rubel who almost kind of reminded me of high school Aaron Sorkin which is a little bit problematic because eventually some of the characters sounded exactly the same which is one of the problems with some Eric's, uh, Aaron Sorkin scripts but either way I just thought there were a number of changes that could have been made to this movie it was funny in spurts but not enough the Outcast gets my rating of a strikeout. Again, very talented cast, very talented writing, but they, there needed to be some tweaks. People are all Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I'm done reviewing the films I have to review for this show, usually I get into a segment of movie news, and I can't really find any movie news that's worth talking about for the next seven minutes or so. So I'm going to do a variation of my segment of what's coming out next, which is sort of a preview of movies that may or may not be coming to the theaters near you. That's coming up in the next segment. For this segment, I'm going to get into what's coming out on DVD and what is available for streaming. I'm not sure exactly what the state of DVD and Blu-ray sales are right now, but I know a lot of people are getting their movies from streaming, and that is perfectly fine. So there are, unfortunately, for August 22nd, this past Tuesday, there aren't a lot of films that are going to be newly available for streaming, but there are some significant ones. One of them is called Scales, Mermaids Are Real, and this is a movie that uh, it looks like a kid's film, and the only movie that is actually coming out for streaming this week beginning August 22nd, is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, which will also be released on DVD and Blu-ray. And I definitely recommend streaming this film. A lot of people don't agree with me on this one, but I do think, in my humble opinion, that Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is actually better than the original, 
albeit slightly, because Guardians, the original Guardians of the Galaxy was pretty cool. But either way, I think most people agree that Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is certainly a worthy sequel. And very much like the Avengers movies, it is working its way up to the next Avengers movie, which is coming out next year. I cannot guarantee that the Guardians of the Galaxy will be in that next Avengers movie, the, the title of which I have temporarily forgotten. Let me see if I can look it up. The Aveng It's the third Avengers movie, and it is called Infinity War. Thank you, Fast Internet. So, I believe the Guardians of the Galaxy will be making an appearance in that movie, but I cannot say for sure. Another movie that's coming out, actually, for streaming, is one that I actually missed. Again, I see four to five movies a week, but I'm actually kind of surprised that I miss some other films. And one of the films that I miss that I don't ever remember being in theaters is one called Kill Switch. It looks to be a sci-fi, actually a straight sci-fi movie. And it's about a pilot who battles to save his family and the planet after an experiment for unlimited energy goes wrong. The stars of this movie include Dan Stevens, uh, Berenice Marlowe, and Tygo Gernant. So I have you ever heard of any of these actors? I haven't. But it looks interesting, at least the premise of it does. And if you actually see the special effects on the planes or I should say hovercrafts themselves, you might be you might like the the movie, but anyway, it is available starting now. It has been since August 22nd, so I definitely recommend check, checking that out. So now that that's pretty much the extent of movies that are coming out for streaming this past Tuesday, August 22nd, I might as well tell you the movies for next Tuesday, August 29th. One of the movies is Born in China, which is a Disney nature film, and Born in China is about panda bears. And it's a movie that I actually missed. It's narrated by John Krasinski. And I think if you like the Disney nature films or nature films in general, you'll like Born in China. That was a movie that when it came out, I didn't bother to see it because, my first of all, my local cinema didn't show it. But also, there's not much to say about nature documentaries. I think the only way they're worth mentioning on the show is if the people who shot the movie did a really bad job. But it just seems like nature movies are one of those things where you take a state-of-the-art camera and you film animals doing their thing. It doesn't mean it's not an interesting movie to watch. It's just a movie I can't really review because it's just point and watch. And, and again, it does take some skill to film these animals without them knowing it. In fact, I, I think there's probably a slew of outtakes of these animals actually noticing the camera and maybe clawing at it. I, I wouldn't doubt it. And I actually saw a story on 60 Minutes that showed how people who are filming penguins for TV documentaries actually create devices that make the cameras look like icicles so that the penguins are less likely to be mesmerized and entranced by it and will just un or candidly go about their business. I thought, that's fascinating. In fact, if they made a movie about the advances in nature movie technology, I would totally be in on that. But again, Born in China, if you want to check it out, it's going to be available on August 29th. That is next Tuesday. Another movie that I remember covering in my in my segment what's coming out next and this is probably a couple of months ago is one called Dean and this is this is a movie that I might actually check out um it is it's a movie that stars Dimitri Martin as well as Kevin Klein, Jillian Jacobs and Mary Steenburgen and it is a comedy about tragedy and Dimitri Mar Martin is one of those stand-up comedians who is very funny, and he certainly has a certain deadpan brand of, of sense of, hu of, of humor that has served him really well in, in the stand-up comedy circuit, not to mention on the, his titular show on Comedy Central. 
And I'm interested to see how this movie is because it's a movie about death, it's a movie about grieving, yet it's a comedy. And I really hate the fact that the movie was in limited release and it didn't come out around where I am, but I'm in Boston, not New York, not LA. So it's not a city, it's a great city, but it's not a city that filmmakers necessarily go out of their way to screen films at. It's just, it's just the way of the world. And another movie that's coming out this is a direct to streaming or what used to be called direct to video is an interesting animated film called Batman and Harley Quinn. Apparently with this movie, Batman and Harley Quinn team up. So again, I might not see that, but if you're interested, it's coming out next Tuesday, August 29th. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and now here's my last segment of the show, What's Coming Out Next. This is a spoken word preview of movies that may or may not be coming to a theater near you. I, I have to emphasize that this is a segment where... I cannot tell you whether the movies I describe are going to be good or bad. I certainly have my expectations for movies, as everybody who goes to the movies probably does. But again, this is not a segment where I am telling you whether to see a movie or not, unless I just say, don't see this movie. But that's in the rare case. I, I probably wouldn't... I think it would probably be one of those propaganda films made by the alt-right, which I would probably say, don't see this film, or a really bad movie star starring somebody disreputable like Polly Shore, where I would probably say, yeah, don't waste your time with this film. But, again, I like to think I would give every movie a chance. So, with that said, let's get into what's coming out next. One of the movies that's coming out this weekend, and it's probably going to be coming to a theater near you, is a movie called All Saints. This is a religious film. It is based on the inspiring true story of salesman-turned-pastor Michael Spurlock, who in this movie is played by John Corbett, the tiny church he was ordered to shut down, and a group of refugees from Southeast Asia. Together, they risk everything to plant seeds for a future that might just save them all. So whenever the character, the main character in a movie, or even a supporting character, is a pastor, that usually means that it's a religious film. However, I'm not going to dismiss it on the basis that it is a religious film. Because, as I said before, every movie deserves a chance. And if I see this movie and I, and I see that it's propaganda, I'll certainly tell you that. However, this movie, very much like thickly veiled religious films looks to have a greater message besides believe in God and you'll be okay, and if you don't believe in God, you're a fire-breathing Satanist. Plus, I like John Corbett. I think he's a very good actor. So I can't say whether or not I will see this movie for sure, but if it is in theaters near me, I will check it out, and I'll let you know what I think next week. Another movie that's coming out this next week is one called Birth of the Dragon. Now this is set against the backdrop of 1960s San Francisco and is a modern take on the classic movies for which Bruce Lee was known. It takes its inspiration from the epic and still controversial showdown between an up-and-coming Bruce Lee and the kung fu master Wong Jack Man, a battle that gave birth to a legend. So the actor who plays Bruce Lee in this film is an actor named, um, oh, okay, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that the, the actor is correct. The actor who plays Bruce, Bruce Lee in this film is Philip Ng, who might be a newcomer. I don't think he's been in many films before, but this is a movie that I think has potential to be good. I mean, I think it will probably inevitably draw comparisons to uh, the movie Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, but that came out in 1993. Not a lot of people might remember that. And according to IMDb, Birth of the Dragon was made last year. So I'm not sure how this movie's going to be. It looks promising. This is probably one of the movies I will see, and I'll let you know what I think about it next week. Another movie that's coming out this coming weekend is Leap. Leap is an animated movie about an orphan girl who dreams of becoming a ballerina and flees her rural Brittany for Paris. I guess Brittany is a real town. Where she passes for someone else and accedes to the position of pupil at the Grand Opera House, again in Paris. The voice actors in this movie include an odd bunch, 
including L. Fanning, which is not so odd, Dane DeHaan, also not so odd, and Carly Rae Jepsen, as in Call Me Maybe, new theme to Fuller House, Carly Rae Jepsen. I guess she's getting into acting now, which is kind of interesting. But again, Leap is a movie that I'm sure will be in wide release. The animation, just judging from the poster, looks iffy, but again, I'm going to give this movie a chance, and I'll let you know what I think when I see it next week. And another movie that's coming out in limited release, and again, I'm, I'm getting close to being out of time here, is one called Tulip Fever. This one looks really good. It's about an artist who falls for a young married woman while he's commissioned to paint her portrait during the tulip mania. I'm not sure what that is, of 17th century Amsterdam. The movie stars Alicia Vikander, Dane DeHaan, Holiday Granger, and Cara Delevingne. Again, Cara Delevingne and Dane DeHaan in a movie together in 2017. That's quite a coincidence, after they were both in Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. Well, Tulip Fever, if it's out in theaters near me, I'll check it out. I'll let you know what I think next week. Meanwhile, that does it with Words on Film for this week. Again, just a reminder that Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic Dan Burke. And they do not necessarily reflect the respective views of any individual employees of the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. With that said, I'm Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.